Yo, what's going on, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Combo Breaker 99 Talks. This is episode four. And, um, you know, I've just been kind of busy this week. Um, I wanted to go back, you know, of course, and talk about the the, the, mate, the biggest the biggest fight, you know, last weekend between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, you know, the rematch. But um, I talked about a lot of different angles with my partner, Boxing P, on um, Jab Podcast. But, you know, I kind of want to go back and just talk about some of the technical things and just a couple of things I missed on the show. You know, um, just as far as, you know, uh, Tyson Fury, you know, his new approach, uh, just some of the things that Wilder didn't expect that they should have expected. And, you know, just again, you know, I kind of want to go back and reiterate about, you know, the the splitting and or the firing of Mark Breland, you know, how serious that was, you know, and how 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 much of a change that could make the Deontay Wilder's camp, you know, not just like technically, but, you know, uh, mentally. You know, we, we, we got to kind of talk about that as well. But um, also, I want to make my prediction, you know, what is it, UFC Fight Night 169. Uh, we got Megan Anderson versus uh, Norma Dumont. And um, we got, who else do we got? Felicia Spencer versus, uh, is it, let me see. I just want to make sure I pronounce her name right. But um, yeah, man, uh, it, it, last weekend was pretty good, you know, as far as the combat sports. You know, we had a lot of Bellator fights. UFC fights and of course you know that ESPN car you know Wilder Fury too. Uh, I just man it just didn't go the way a lot of people felt it would you know and um I think that's what to me kind of like brought out this negative energy the way a lot of people just kept on like you know there were a lot of casual fans approaching me saying I told you Tyson Fury would win I was like well this is the first time you made a prediction that was right you know this is the first time y'all actually made a prediction to me that was right where now y'all feel comfortable to tell me y'all know about boxing, you know? So it's crazy, man. Just a lot of people now feel like, oh, yeah, I'm an expert on boxing because I, like, I predicted my, the guy I wanted to win. That's how it is for a lot of people. Whenever they predict, like, the guy they want to win, all of a sudden it's like, yo, and he wins. It's like, yo, I, I know everything about boxing, you know? But, um, yeah, okay, this weekend we got Felicia Spencer versus is it Zara, Zara Dos Santos, you know, Two featherweight fights, you know, Megan Anderson versus Norma Dumont, and yeah, Felicia Spencer versus Zara Dos Santos. So, those are gonna be interesting fights, you know, uh, for as long as they last. I I see both of those like going inside of three, really. But um, last weekend we you know we had some good fights, like I said, you know, as far as the women, uh, Bellator 239, you know, Denise Kierholz, she uh she submitted Christina Williams in one round and. That's one fight I, I want to talk about real quick because I'm like, yo, Denise Kilho, she's a beast, man. She's like, to me, she's that next thing coming up at flyweight. You know, I think Alina, Leia McFarlane, people like that, they got to watch out. Uh, who, Juliana Velasquez, you know, they, they, you know, she's like a, she's like a powerhouse right now. I mean, the way she approaches her fights, you know, you think she's going to score a knockout, but she comes out of nowhere and just submits you. So I, I feel like she's she's really getting a good fundamental. She's putting together her fundamentals as far as becoming a complete mixed martial artist. And um, somebody like Christina Williams, you know, uh, like I said, I, I kind of felt like she would have got stopped just because of the approach she takes to a fight, you know, as far as taking shots and, you know, taking shots to give shots and just kind of stepping in there unguarded. So I was like, yo, Denise Kills probably stop her like in two or three rounds. But, yo, as soon as she like hurt her and, and she caught that leg, she got her down. She just jumped on the back and she choked her out. And that was it. You know, so I'm like, yo, Denise Kill, she's really a beast. You know, I did a, a post fight video on that. So definitely check that out. You know, I did that like uh, a few days ago. So if you want to hear me talk more technical about that, you know, just check that out. But um, let's see, who else do we have? You know, I just go down the list. We had Bellator Ireland, you know, Danny Nealon making her um, second Bellator fight. J.R. Pinko, she lost by unanimous decision. That was her Bellator debut. Then we had the uh, main event, Leah McCourt versus Ju- Judith Reyes. They made history because that was like, I think like the first main event for uh, women, you know, I think overseas or, or, or was it just Bellator in general? You know, let me know in the comments section. But um, who else did we have? Bellator 240, you know, Beck Rollins, she came back against Alina Caliendo. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, Beck Rollins, you know, she trying to get back in that winner. You know, she's trying to get back in that winner circle. She called out Heather Hardy. So. So be some interesting fights, you know, in the flyweight division. I think that a lot of people they kind of underestimate the Bellator flyweight division. You know, they they don't really uh, give it as cre- give it the credit it deserves. But um, 
what else do we have? UFC Fight Night 168 last week. You know, I did post fights on all these vi- uh, on all these fights. You know, Cachoeira versus Dobson, Angela Hill versus Loma Labutni, and of course, you know, Jan Zhao versus Carolina Kovalkiewicz. Man, next to Deontay Wilder, I think that the Carolina fight was kind of one of the most stomach churning beatings I've seen on that weekend. You know, I think that uh, Carolina, she really needs to rethink. Uh, she just has to rethink a lot of things as far as like wanting wanting to wanting to commit with your heart to fighting and not making sure that you know your mental is in it. You know, making sure your mental is in it, making sure your body's in it. All three of those things to me they have to they have to sync up. You know, your heart, your your mind, your your body. All three of those things have to sync up when you fight because if one is out of sync. And then you could wind up really getting hurt. You know, to me in this fight, her heart was in it, but her body wasn't. You know, you already see her body language was, you know, on the defense. You know, she looked weaker. You know, she couldn't even she couldn't even hurt Yan Zhaonan in this fight. You know, in the past, you've seen Carolina take some real, like, scrappy approaches to fights. And, you know, she can go back and forth with the best of them. You know, she could go in there and trade. She could go in there and hurt you or do damage. But this time, she was just on the back foot, you know, getting hit from the body, you know, to the legs, to the head. And, you know, then after that, she suffered the broken um, cheekbone in the first round. So it was just like, yo, your body wasn't in it, even though your heart was. And your mind, at the same time, it wasn't like trying to make an adjustment or or pull you through this fight. So everything to me in Carolina's fight last Saturday just showed me that she was out of sync. And I wouldn't even make the suggestion like I did with Shannon Dobson to go to Invicta. Because if you go to Invicta, It'll be the same outcome. It's just a different caliber of opponent. It's it's not the it's not the opponents that you're facing anymore. As far as you know, you working on fundamentals. It's just you, as far as not being all the way in it anymore. You know, Carolina is just not. Carolina is just not in sync to be a fighter anymore. You know, I hate to say that because I'm I'm a I'm a fan of her, but I say it like that because I don't want to see the fighter get hurt. You know. I don't want to see somebody like her just go in there and, you know, continue to fight because you're tough. You know, I want to see you fight because you got the complete package. You know, you're you're smart. You know, you got the drive uh, and you're tough. But for me, Carolina Kovacavich, you know, I think that after seeing that fight and the damage she took, you know, her having to have eye surgery now, you know, she talked about it on Instagram. I think that it might just be time to hang it up, you know. You know, and that's real like again you know there's so many other things she could do but you know i talked about all this in my post fight video when i just was talking about carolina so you can go back and check that out as well but um yeah man it, it was just it was just really rough watching her you know go through that that type of punishment man but yeah going on to this this next fight you know the main event on um saturday that had everybody on the edge of their seats uh deontay wilder versus tyson fury too um i just feel like when it all when it's all said and done, you know, I hate to use that word exposed for somebody like Deontay Wilder because, you know, he was always the type of fighter just to commit to what he did. You know, he was just like a puncher. You know, he never tried to say he was anything else uh, in his interviews. He always talked about being just good for two seconds. But in the long run, in the long run, you know, that's what you're kind of setting yourself up for a fight like this. You know, you're setting yourself up for failure whenever you, you take on, you know, a guy who's multidimensional, you know, somebody like Tyson Fury, um, he, he, he is a student of the game, you know, you can't knock that, um, he came into the game, you know, on his boxing, you know, as far as, you know, his IQ, you know, of, of trying to polish things up, he wasn't just all about power, or all about knocking people out, he was all about just, you know, crafting the style that fit his, his body frame, and his elusiveness, you know, and I think that's why he hooked up with, uh, you know, Sugar Hill Stewart on this one, because he didn't need to con- he didn't need to completely change anything in his game plan. He just needed somebody to fine tune certain things that would help him out with a dangerous puncher like Deontay Wilder. So, you know, somebody like Tyson Fury, you know, he doesn't really need like at this point of his career, he doesn't need like a trainer to mold him. You know, he knows who he is. He just needs somebody from the outside looking in saying, well, if you switch this up, it'll work against, you know, a puncher like Wilder. If you take this type of approach physically, you know, 
it'll it'll nullify whatever Wilder brings to the table, you know. And I feel like that's what Sugar Hill was able to do with uh, Tyson Fury. And I, man, I'm not gonna lie, man. Like going into this one, like I only saw this fight going two different ways, you know. Um, I was like, Deontay Wilder is gonna win by knockout. That was my prediction. But like I said, the fight's 50-50. So I said if he don't win by knockout, he's gonna get outboxed by Tyson Fury, you know, in a much cleaner decision than the first fight, you know, but again, Tyson Fury, he didn't get the script. You know, he was like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a new approach. I'm going toe to toe with Wilder. And when you think about that, when you first think toe to toe, you're thinking that he's like on the inside trading with Wilder and to go toe to toe for Wilder to knock him out. You know, Wilder has to have that type of toe to toe style. But when you think about it, it sounded dangerous because just think the words toe to toe mean you're trading blows, you're trading punches. And we're automatically thinking of Deontay Wilder's power. But, you know, somebody like Deontay Wilder, his style isn't toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You know, he's not an inside fighter. His, he's a puncher, but he generates his punch from a more relaxed range for him. You know, he's more of a mid-range fighter where he can get full extension off his shots. You know, nobody's in his face. Nobody's smothering him. You know, he's getting full extension if the guy's backs it, backing up. Or if the guy just kind of like steps in when he he can time it. So he's like a, you know, he's an educated puncher with the one style he brings to the table. But he hasn't developed his punching, his punching style into like more multi-dimensional styles. You know what I mean? Like when you look at somebody like Marcos Maidana, you know, he's a puncher. But to me, I feel like, you know, he can brawl with his punching power or he can set it up. You know, he can time you, you know, he can time you with the overhand right. Or he can straight go in the inside and, you know, trade uppercuts and trade right hands on the inside with you, you know, left hooks or whatever. But um, I feel like Deontay Wilder, his approach is more so always at his pace, you know, which it always has to deal with his opponents. You know, his opponents are really, really intimidated by the power already. So they're already giving Deontay Wilder the advantage. So Tyson Fury, he saw this, you know, he saw this approach, that, you know, he saw the approach that he took last time and all the other opponents took and so he was like yo i gotta meet this guy in the middle you know and by toe to toe i don't think that he's gonna have the approach for this because he's not really like an inside puncher you know he's not that type of guy to go blow for blow with you so whenever tyson fury took this new approach he said okay what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna meet him in the middle i'm gonna walk him down but in order to do that i'm gonna also add this weight to my body you know, I'm also going to add about, what was he, like 250 something last time. This time he added on another 20 pounds. So, again, like when people for, first heard this, I like myself, I was like, you know, if he, if he has 273, you know, if he goes up to 273, you know, and he tries to box from the outside, he's really going to wear himself out, you know. But he took a whole different approach. He was like, yo, I'm going to put this weight on. I'm going to walk him down. And as soon as that bell rings, I'm going to come straight forward. And I'm going to meet him in the middle. I'm going to smother his punches. And as soon as like he misses a shot, I'm going to step in and lean on him. And that's smart. You know, De again, Deontay Wilder, he's not used to having like a almost 300 pound man just leaning on him and muscling him. You know, and I think that right there kind of put everything out the door for Deontay Wilder af after the second round. Because the first couple rounds, I know Tyson Fury was kind of feeling him out. Deontay Wilder was kind of feeling him out. And I feel like uh wilder he secured the first two rounds by by much but you know he was able to crack fury with the right hand a few times but tyson fury you know with the new weight i think that definitely helped his uh it really helped his uh his ability to take a punch you know his durability so again that weight was a plus for him because I, I saw in that second round where wilder stepped in and cracked him with the right hand i was like damn you know, no buckle. You know, he didn't even get buckled this time. I was like, yo, so right there, I was like, yo, Deontay's in for a fight here. And then all of a sudden in the third round, whenever Tyson Fury started cracking with a few jabs and kind of shaking him up, I was like, you know, th this is a different type of fight. You know, Wilder's really going to have to fight this time. And then, like, I think what was that third or fourth round, whenever Tyson Fury, like, caught him over by the ear and he just went down and from there i was like yo this is like a totally different fight and like you could see the body language and the eyes of deontay wilder like it wasn't like a full-on like shot that you know rocked his chin but it was just that 
it was that um that shot by the ear that messes with your equilibrium like the um the andy ruiz anthony joshua fight you know when you get hit right there it's going to take rounds or you might not ne- you might never recover from from that in the fight and that's what happened to deontay wilder like deontay wilder's legs was just gone his whole balance was gone his whole focus was gone after that after that first knockdown and um just a few like little technical things i wanted to talk about it that i did see um especially like you know the the the, the fact that people have been talking about this has been going on about the the glove the glove issue um i've seen fighters do that before you know i i saw tyson fury do that the first time where he would kind of flick the flick the flick the um hand out because his uh his fist is close by the wrist part of the glove you know so you can kind of get more more impact from a from a from a bare fist you know you can kind of get that bare knuckle type of impact on your opponent and yeah i've seen people do that before but it's, it is kind of illegal but you know again it's a fight and there's certain things in there I, I see that you just can't always complain to the ref or you just can't always try to you know get overturned or call a person to cheat. i mean holding and hitting you know um hitting behind the by the kidneys those are just like little tricks of the trade and i think that it's up to the fighter to kind of make that adjustment to avoid that, you know? And I think the thing with Deontay Wilder, like it happened in the first fight with the fist, you know, the, the, you know, the wrist being in that part of the glove, it happened in the first fight, but it's kind of like, you only notice it when you lose, you know, like they were able to get away with it the first time, you know, Deontay Wilder was able to make the adjustment to take the punch and get away with it. But this time, you know, you only notice it when you lose. And I'm just kind of like, yo, if y'all, if y'all would have been a little bit more technical as far as like getting away from certain punches, you know, y'all could have avoided that, you know, cause he was kind of hitting him with that shot a lot, kind of flicking it out where it'll hit the neck or hit the ear. So he's hitting him in like these sensitive points, you know? So it's all on Deontay Wilder from there to say, man, he keeps hitting me with this shot. I better hit him back. You know, I got hit him the same way he hit me or get the, you know, get away from the shot, you know, because there was a lot of, things in here that Deontay Wilder did technically wrong too, as far as, you know, stepping to his left, you know, um, Tyson Fury was like just flicking him, hitting him with the jab. And he would kind of, Wilder would kind of step out to his left. And lo and behold, I was like, oh man, if he keeps stepping to his left while he's on the ropes, the right hand came over the top the first time I thought it and cracked him, you know, then constantly, you know, Fury just kept making Wilder move to his left. He kept hitting him with the right hand. So I was like, there was a lot of things in there. Like, you know, technically that I felt like Deontay Wilder, you know, they, they kind of, um, they kind of abandoned cause I'm sure they, I'm sure Mark Breland, they went over this stuff in training. So to me, it's just like, yo, there was a lot of stuff that he just abandoned, you know, kind of mentally. And, um, this was kind of a, a, a this is kind of like his chance to show that he could switch gears, you know, especially after getting knocked down and getting hurt, you know, um, I know Deontay Wilder is the kind of guy who doesn't want to quit, You know, he's tough, wants to show the good chin. But to me, when you're taking this type of beating, it's not about taking the beating and proving you can take it. It's about how you can overcome the beating and, you know, overcome that mountain. You know, don't just like that. Keep rolling down the mountain and showing that you could you could. Oh, man, I can withstand, you know, rolling like this, hitting rocks and, you know, getting my face cut up and all that. And I I can just withstand. No, it's about like finding the point to stop yourself from falling down grabbing on to something, pulling yourself back up and making it over that mountaintop, you know, if that makes sense. You know, that's why I kind of felt like Wilder was just in there showing he could take punishment to go out on his shield, but he never like made a full on adjustment to say, I can overcome this hump, you know, and get over it. So we just go back and look at a lot of stuff in just that seventh round. I felt like Tyson Fury just showed so much and you know Wilder, he shows so little, and um, that you know that's not the bash Deontay Wilder. I'm talking about it like this because you know I'm a fan of Wilder, and um, I seen a lot of these uh, technical mistakes he made before, but to me it was up to him in this fight to show that he didn't need that stuff. You know, if he, if he really that that's why I said going into this fight, I was like, yo, he has to take that Roy approach, like versus Montel Griffin, blast Tyson Fury out. You know, no feeling out. Just go straight in there and knock him out. But but at the same time, be prepared for whatever Tyson Fury brings to the table. You know, 
don't go in there saying like in the press conference, you already knocked him out or, you know, he's, you know, he's easy. You know, we went through this the first time I'm going to knock him out. No, nah, man. Like when you take an approach to a guy like Tyson Fury and I told Box and Peters, I was like, yo, expect the unexpected, you know, always prepare for the worst. Matter of fact, that's the name of our new episode with Jad Podcast is um, prepare for the worst. Because to me, it's like, yo, when you get in there, it's good to envision yourself as the winner to a, a certain extent. But understand that somebody like Tyson Fury, you know, he's also coming in with the mindset to win. But he's also preparing for the worst. You know, he knows that you're one of the sickest punchers out there. So Tyson Fury remembers getting knocked down. You know, Tyson Fury is like, yo, I remember that. So I'm thinking of the worst. And in order to get away from the worst possible scenario, you got to craft your, you got to craft your style. You know, you got to work on certain things to prevent that. So Tyson Fury, he went back to the drawing board and said, damn, I remember me getting knocked down. I pro- he, you know, he probably pitches himself getting knocked down in this fight. So he said, yo, to avoid that, I'm going to have to smother Wilder. I can't let Wilder get relaxed and find that range with his punch. So because if he does, he's going to knock my ass out. Man, I can see it. He just knocked me down. But Tyson Fury said, OK, if that happens or to prevent that from happening, I'm going to lay on his ass. You know, I'm going to I'm going to smother. I'm going to show him who the bigger man is. I'm going to, you know, use these little tricks on the inside that, you know, nobody else knows about, you know. So it's all part of the game. And, you know, whenever a guy's able to get away with little tricks like that, it's up to you to say, oh, you, you fight like that. I go tit for tat with you, you know. But again, you know, Deontay Wilder didn't take that straight on dog approach in this one. And and, you know, like I said, I'm not bashing him, but there was just probably a lot of things. Like he said too, like the, you know, the suit. I hate to bring up the suit because I personally don't feel like that's a good excuse to to blame to blame this you know the suit walking out, you know walking your you, ring entry suit. I I just can't you know use that as, use that as an excuse. You know, um, I was looking at a video on Fight Hype. You know, shout out to Fight Hype. They were doing the Roy Jones Jr. interview. And Roy talked about um, this, you know, this suit, you know, he was like, that's not a good excuse because, you know, like he said before, he played a he played a basketball game. You know, he played a basketball game before a fight. I remember that fight. It was um, at super middleweight. But uh, who was he fight? Eric Lucas. You know, he was fighting Eric Lucas. and He still scored a stoppage that night, you know. So he also mentioned the fact that, you know, he uses a weighted vest, you know, he uses a weighted vest for shadow boxing. And I see a lot of fighters do this, you know, fighters use weighted vests to, um, you know, build up their strength, you know, build up that, that, that endurance and build up your, you know, your legs overall. So I think it just comes down to legs, you know, um, Deontay, he kind of came in a little bit more top heavy, but that weight really wasn't distributed. Right. So, when it's all said and done, you know, you're thinking about Deontay Wilder coming in a little bit heavier up top, which is new to his body. And you got another guy who's coming in, you know, 40 pounds heavier than you. And he's laying on you and you've got these, you know, these legs that are just about done. You know, imagine what that's going to do to you. You know, that's that's just going to take you out of the fight even quicker. But like I said, it's probably just somewhere Deontay Wilder, you know, he wouldn't have really made that excuse if he had stronger legs. And that's just my opinion because it's a 40 plus pound suit, you know, and you're standing back there for maybe like 10, 15 minutes, you know, that's, um, that should be nothing to you really, you know, that's just my opinion, you know, as far as that, you know, but I don't know what else was going on as far as, you know, that could have wore him out because, um, you know, uh, just going back and looking at Deontay Wilder's reactions in there, uh, he was outgunned, but, you know, just looking in his eyes, you know, it was like, yo, you know, he was already, he was already kind of like out of the fight. You know, he was just taking so much punishment and a lot of these, you know, a lot of the punches he was taking, I was like, yo, he's taking these shots, man. Like, why is he not getting out of the way? You know, when um get knocked down two times, but uh, there was one knockdown too, like the body shot knocked down. I did kind of see it was, it was, um, it was scored as a legit knock knockdown, but I mean you could disagree with me or not. But I went back and looked at it like five times in a row, and that that one knockdown to the body, I, I I did mention that in my post fight as a knockdown, but it was more of a slip because you know Fury's um 
Fury's knee or leg hit Wilder's uh, left leg at the same time he stepped in and Wilder was already off balance and then he lands the punch to kind of knock him down. So he was already on his way down. So another that another thing, that was just another little veteran trick that Tyson Fury did. You know, he was able to use that little sleight of hand thing, you know, where it's like, I'm going to knock him off balance, but I'm going to go ahead and hit him too, you know. So there's certain knockdowns that happen like that. You know, you're able to, you know, trip the guy up and it's so quick. Because like I had to look at it several times. Like I said, you know, Fury's leg did hit Wilder's to like take his balance from out from under and then he lands the body shot so and when you think about it if Tyson if if Deontay Wilder was really hurt to the body you would have saw him like cringing especially from a liver shot you know so there was just that little knockdown too that's why I say it was just like a lot a, like a lot of little uh I won't say I won't say like what can I say you know just a little cheats that Tyson Fury was able to do in this one you know and, and get away with it but I call those old school veteran tricks you know um, there's certain things in a fight you have to do to win, you know, cause this is a boxing match. So it's a chess match, but at the same time, it's a fight. You can either make it a boxing match. You can make it a fight. And whenever it's a fight, guys are usually going to try to find little ways to win as long as they can get away with it. As long as they can get away with it within means of the referee not seeing or like, you know, the commission or something, you know, saying anything, they're going to ride with it. And sometimes you can't blame people like that. You've seen it so many times in the past, whether you know how to hold or hit where the referee can't see it. Or, you know, again, like the placement of your hands or your punches or hitting people in certain places. If you get away with it, you ride with it. You know, I, I don't condone it, but I mean, it happens, you know. But, um, yeah, man, overall, man, like Tyson Fury, he just executed a good game plan um, that Deontay Wilder, he wasn't prepared for. And, um, yeah, uh, I. I just have to say that Deontay Wilder, like he really showed that he needs to add more to his arsenal as a puncher. Like I'm not telling a guy to become a boxer overnight. You know, I don't want to see him try to become a boxer like, you know, uh, a Floyd or a Rigo or some <laughs> something like that, you know, or Lennox Lewis. But I think he could take some pages out of Lennox Lewis's book, you know, not a full on, you know, you know, not a full on novel, but maybe just like a chapter or two where we can see him, you know, be a little bit more mobile. You know, don't be so stiff, uh, you know, set up the right hand more with the jab, you know, make the, you know, build up the power on the left where you got, you know, a jab feeling like a straight left hand, you know, make it feel like a southpaw left straight. You know, I want to see that that jab, you know, just like bust through guards and damage people so much that you know they don't see the right hand coming you know you got so dependent on the right hand being the the one hitter quitter that i kind of feel like so many other things were abandoned you know so just just certain things you know he got to go back and take take out of you know real punches books you know julian jackson like julian jackson had power in both hands but he could box to set it up you know so two different weight classes and two different frame you know body frames but it can be done you know like I would just like to see, you know, uh, Deontay Wilder build more. I mean, I, he's 34, but, you know, um, we all get older, you know, and that doesn't mean we got to stop learning new things. You know, like I'm not going to say my age, but, you know, there's certain things that I'm going to go back and, you know, work on as far as not boxing, but just certain things that I kind of want to add to my add to my mind. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's never too late. If you're still breathing and kicking, it's never too late. You know, I know people are going to say that you can't teach old dog new tricks. You know, it's been 42 fights. You know, he can't box. He's too late. Like, yeah, he can learn, man. He can still learn. Like, and like I said, it's not about learning how to box again. It's just about adding to his arsenal now and making that better. And uh, with that being said, like bringing up the fact that uh, somebody like George Foreman reaches out to you. Matter of fact, let me pull that Instagram up. Uh, let me see the Instagram he put up, which I put on the Jab Effect page. You know, I got a lot of good response on that. So go to my Instagram at the Jab Effect. You know, I posted. Uh, let me see. A couple of days ago, you know, I posted the fact that George Foreman wanted to train Deontay Wilder. You know, um, he said this on his Twitter. Maybe it's time for Deontay Wilder to come spend the two to four weeks with me. Happy for Fury, but see a need for Wilder. You know, that's big too, man. That you know, that's big because that's that's deep whenever you got like, you know, a Hall of Famer, you know, one of the big guys in the game, old school legend that, 
you know, they, they see what happened to you. And it's not necessarily like they're feeling pity or feeling sorry for you, but they feel like they're, there's still a need for you in the game. Like he said, like you, you just lost, but it's like, yo, we, we got to get you back in there because you can't go out like this champ. You know, it, that's basically what George Foreman is saying. So George Foreman is reaching out to him, you know, like man to man, fighter to fighter, puncher to puncher. And, you know, got a lot of good response on that, too, because um, I like the response. Like I was never like the biggest George Foreman fan of his style, but I'm like, yo, the dude committed to what he did. You know, he really committed to his style. You know, I remember how they used to kind of make fun of how he threw punches even like before their fight. And, uh, you know, before that fight, uh, Rumble in the Jungle, you know, Ali was kind of, you know, bashing how Foreman threw punches. But it was George Foreman's style, you know. And um, I think that's what George Foreman is going to try to teach somebody like um, Deontay Wilder is uh, not to punch like him, but commitment. You know, commitment and more of a, a versatility to the puncher, puncher style. You know, somebody like George Foreman knew he was strong as hell. He um, had the power, but he he knew he had to generate the power in different ways. You know, he was generating the power through the jab. You know, George Foreman had one of the best, hardest jabs. Not like the best technically thrown stiff jab like somebody like Joe Lewis or Ali, but there was so much power behind that damn telephone pole on his left shoulder that, you know, he could win a whole fight off the jab. Like, go back and look at the fight with, um, damn, mom. it was a close, controversial fight with uh, Alex Stewart. But the fact that he landed like 99 jabs on Alex Stewart's head and the way he was landing, I was like, yo, this dude has like one of the killer jabs in the game. Like, you can't block it either, man. Like, you block it, you still going to get hurt. You know, and I feel like somebody like George Foreman, Linking up with Deontay Wilder, he could kind of teach him like, yo, man, if you want to be this puncher, let's add more to your punching style. Let's add more to your game. You know, let's not just make it about the right hand. You know, let's um also add in the left. So both of these hands scare people. You know, not everybody's looking for the right hand because we're going to add the left to the game, too. You know, we're going to add this powerhouse jab. Also, like we're going to teach you how to punch back and up. You know, we're going to teach you how to punch on the inside, you know, throw more vicious uppercuts on the inside, commit to the uppercuts. You know, so I think like somebody George Foreman, he's not going to be there to start him from scratch or teach him how to be this Ali S boxer. He's not even going to teach him how to be a George. Like I said, you know, he's just going to teach him how to commit to being an all around puncher, you know, just to be an all-around puncher. That's what I think somebody like George Foreman could do for Deontay Wilder. Teach him to be that all-around puncher. You know, um, add more to his arsenal. Add more to the right hand. But something about Big George, man. You know, George is big all around. You know, it all goes back to them legs, you know. I think, you know, George, he was able to generate that power and walk guys down for rounds until it took however many rounds it took because, you know, he had the power in them legs. So, I think somebody like George is going to teach him how to become a could could teach him how to become like a devastating puncher with them by building up them legs, you know, building up the leg muscles, you know, because when you go back and look at a lot of these punches, even today, you know, like somebody like Danny Garcia, you know, he's flat footed, but he's strong on the legs. You know, he's strong as far as keep standing his ground, you know, and um, even go back to my breakdown. I kind of gave Wilder the edge and strength, which I was kind of wrong about because I didn't really, at the time, I was just kind of thinking about his ability to be so strong at 212 pounds. You know, I didn't fully think about the physical with his legs this time. You know, I was just kind of really amped up for the fight. But yeah, when you think about it, like he needs that strong foundation. And I think somebody like George Foreman can, you know, go back and teach him a hey, if you want to generate that power, you got to build them legs up as well. You know, if you want to be able to stand your ground and be more mobile and deliver the power in different ways, you need to build those legs up. So, um, yeah, man, I, I really think that adding George to his corner would help. And um, also, man, um, speaking of his corner, I think that um, the the firing, you know, it's still kind of like rumored or, you know, some people still say like it's still possible he could come back, but the fact that he got rid of Mark Breland too, man, I was just kind of like, yo, that's cold, man. Like I talked about on this, I talked about it in a video already, but I just kind of want to go back. Cause I feel like, you know, Martin Breland kind of, 
he kind of got done wrong, you know, um, in the heat of the moment, you know, Wilder's going to be pissed off, but you got to remember, that's the whole purpose of having a trainer. You know, the trainer's going to see things you don't see, whether it's good or bad. And De and Mark Breland is there to create that balance. You know, you want to go out on your shield, Deontay Wilder, you know, as a fighter, you want to say, yo, it's a warrior code. I, I want to die in there, but that's the whole purpose of somebody like Mark Breland. Mark Breland is to tell you, you know, this is still one fight. You know, this isn't full on war and you want to live to fight another day. And if you don't show and if you don't show like the actual style or skill in this certain fight to to beat a guy and you're just taking a beating and you're just getting dominated. It's up to that guy looking from the outside. It's, it's up to that guy on the outside looking in to say, let's let's hang it up today, man, you know. We can't do it today, man. You're, you're, you're in bad shape. You're about to die in there, man. I can, you know, it's, it's about over. You know, no, no, I, I got to stop it. And Mark really, he did that thing, you know, because, again, a fighter, they go in there with the killer instinct. I, you know, I always suggest that, you know, make sure you have that killer instinct before you go in there. But we're not going to die in there if we can prevent that, you know. Because how, how is that? How's that going to feel for Mark Breland? You know, he go to his, you know, his wife and say, yo. I could have stopped it, but I didn't, you know, he, he wanted to die in there. So I let him die in there. You know, nah, nah, a trainer, a trainer is there to look out for your well-being. You know, a trainer is there to say, we'll fight another day if you can't commit today. And a trainer is also there to make sure you get home safe. You know, a trainer is there to train you for everything, you know, as far as, you know, not taking punches and your defense. He, he's there to teach you how to hit and not get hit you know that's that that's their whole thing and when you start getting hit too much and it's too much for you to take you know okay well, well first we'll say you start getting hit first of all the trainer will say you know okay we'll we'll avoid punches okay avoid punches man you stop getting hit but the more and more you get beat up throughout rounds you're just looking bad and you're bleeding from the mouth you're bleeding from the ear it's like yo man we i'm gonna give you one more round you know but when you start getting beaten to the mission and you're not throwing back, hey, that 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 towel comes off and it goes into the ring, you know, because hey, I'm not letting you die in there. <clears throat> you know, it's like, yo, I'm not letting you die in there, you know, and I I, I really respect uh, Mark Breland for that, because, you know, we were as fans, we were watching from the outside saying, yo, when is this going to stop? You know, after round five, I was like, yo, when's this going to stop? Because I was like, yo, Deontay's not showing us anything. You know, he's not loading the. He's not loading the right hand up. His legs are gone. He's bleeding from the ear. You know, um, body language and the eyes was just like not there. So I was like, yo, when it, when are they going to stop it? You know, first I thought Kenny Baylor stopped it, but he was reacting off of uh, Mark Breland's towel. You know, so I was like, finally, you know, because um, it was just one of them things, too, because, you know, um, some guys, they'll tell the fighter right there. Like, if you ain't showing me something in between rounds, they'd be like, yo, we, we stopping it. But. Mark Breland at the time, he was like, you know, we're talking about a former Olympian, former gold medalist, former champion himself who's been in the trenches, who's been who's been down before. You know, he's been knocked out before. So he don't want the same thing to happen to him to happen to Wilder, you know. So if he can prevent it on his clock, you know, he's like, yo, I'm stopping it. You know, I, I, th th this guy still has so much to his game. Or, you know, this guy is still a young fighter to him. And we want to see him fight another day, but he might not if I let him continue to go out on his shield, you know. So I'm just kind of rambling, ranting on that because I'm just kind of like, yo, man, like I thought that was cold. And, and you know, after the fight, the post fight, you know, uh, Jay Diaz, he kind of spoke on it. You know, he just came right out and said, you know, that was Mark Breland that threw the towel in. But to me, I kind of would have stood with Mark Breland. I would have said, yo, Mark did the right choice. You know, I would have been like, yo, Mark did the right choice. I was on it. I was with him. You know, I would have just said it just like that, too. I would have been like, I'm standing by him. You know, I don't care if it is wild. I'd just be like, yo, he did right. You know, it was my choice, too. You know, because him not standing with him, it, Jay not standing with Mark in that situation, it kind of got Mark put into a corner. And, you know, it was said that after the fight, you know, Deontay told him he was out. He wouldn't let him in the dress room. And Mark really kind of cried. Like, like I said, those are just some rumors, but... If that's true, that was kind of cold. So uh, to me, it was kind of like if Jay Diaz would have stood with him, then Wilder might have not have said nothing because it would have been 
two against one. At the same time, it would have been your whole corner saying that, yo, you didn't show me some. Now it just kind of makes it makes it look like there's there's a, you know, kind of an unorganization in the corner where it's not like a unanimous decision in the corner to throw the towel in. You know, it was just all on one man who felt like he saw his fighter in trouble, you know. So how did the other guys feel? You know, like Mark, he actually like felt in his heart like Deontay's getting beat right now. So I got to stop this. But where was everybody else at? Wasn't everybody else agreeing with that? You know, I so you know I just kind of feel like he got kind of he got kind of got did wrong on that. But if I could tell Deontay, I would tell him, yo, you know, Mark really thought the best of you. Thought the he made the best situation. Um, he made the best choice for you in that situation, and um, you can't fire him for that, man. You got to make sure you bring him back. You 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 speak it off. You think it off emotion right now. So just just um give the guy another chance. You know um. To me, that was the best choice made all night in the wider corner, you know, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, man, like I said, just kind of a lot of technical stuff I kind of want to go back and talk on. And um, as far as the rubber match happening, you know, I think Wilder has maybe like 24 days at this point, 23, 24 days to respond to Bob Arum as far as making this match happen. And maybe like August or sometime in the summer. Um, Again, man, like. I I don't know, man. I don't know um, if he should take this fight right away, man, because it was kind of one of those box versus punches matches where you you kind of see you you kind of see need you kind of seen all you needed to see at that point, you know, because we didn't really get an answer to make us say this was back and forth, you know, this wasn't like Pacquiao Morales where it had to go three times or two or two times. Um, where it was unanswered you know it kind of reminds me of course this was different because it wasn't a knockout but it was kind of like winky wright versus uh felix trinidad like it was a complete shutout you know winky wright won 12 rounds scored like 199 jabs in the fight and um it made you say like i don't think there's a need to have a rematch because you know what outcome will be the same you know but this being the heavyweight division, you know, anything could happen. So I could definitely see that, you know, I could definitely see them wanting to exercise it, especially whenever, you know, the top guys are Wilder, Fury, and Joshua. So if somebody like Joshua was granted his rematch against Ruiz, I think that um, Wilder, he should be granted his. And when you think about it, both of their Joshua and um, Wilder, both both of them, their beatings were kind of the same to me. They both were pretty stomach turning. Um, again, probably because of those like ear shots and those concussive shots they took. But I feel like, yeah, Wilder does deserve that chance. But I don't know if right away, you know, just because there was a lot of damage as far as the ear. And um, I, I think there's a little bit. There's a few more like technical things for Wilder to kind of work on to add to his game, especially like. If he was to answer George Foreman's call, you know, if he was to answer George Foreman's call, then, you know, you might want to uh, push the fight back a little bit and kind of work on some things. And if you did get rid of Mark Breland, then you're probably going to bring in another trainer, another side trainer. So with that trainer, you might want to take the time to grow with him a little bit, you know, get to to work on some things. So I personally don't think he should take it right away, maybe take a fight in between. But. You know, go ahead and let Aram know that you want to fight, but maybe not right now, you know. But again, if he wants to cash grab, then go ahead and get it. But I kind of see the outcome being the same, you know, unless you don't jump straight on him. Being the puncher of, that you are, you have to jump straight on, him, you know, and that's bottom line. Like you can't let why you can't let Fury get into a rhythm because that's his game rhythm. You know, the guy moves and dances and slips and slides and that's all he wants, you know. But yeah, man, overall, it was just like a good boxing um, execution from Tyson Fury. Um, Don't like that weirdo shit that he did, like the licking of the blood thing. I thought that was weird. You know, Um, that (laughs) that was just weird, man. Like it just made me like, (laughs) like you're already beating the guy. But I thought that was just kind of like humiliating and disgusting. Just like even goes back, you know, people, they talked about the Tyson with the ear thing. You know, I felt disgusted when Tyson bit Holyfield's ear, but licking somebody's blood to me is it's okay it's not as painful as it looks but it's pretty 
It's just as disturbing. You know, watching somebody lick somebody's neck, their blood, and it does get disgusting, you know. So I would have taken a point from that. <laughs> you know, because Kenny Bales did take a point for like holding, but I would have took a point for that shit. Man, that was just gross, man. But that's just me. But um, yeah, man. Overall, like I said, good fight, good boxing match. But words to Wilder, you know, just keep your head up, man, and um, be willing to accept defeat. You know, humiliation, humble yourself. Uh, welcome Mark Breland back. You know, just apologize to him. You know, at this point, you know, you probably thinking emotionally, so. Just go back and, you know, work on some things, you know, just go back and work on what's needed. You know, don't have too many yes men in your corner telling you that you you look the best and you all need to be perfect for two seconds. You know, even yourself, don't tell yourself that. Always expect the worst, you know. Um, or if you don't want to always expect the worst, prepare for the worst. You know, this that's two different things. You know, if you don't want to expect the worst, prepare for the worst, at least, you know. But um, yeah, man. Like I said, you can go check out the Jab Podcast. You know, we kind of talked about different angles with my man Boxing P. But um, real quick, you know, I, I was going to do some uh, breakdown or prediction videos for these two fights. But I'll go ahead and do them now, man. Um, Women's featherweight division. We got two fights. Uh, UFC fight night 169 tomorrow starting at 8 o'clock on ESPN+. Plus. I'm actually off this Saturday, so I'll check it out. But, um. Man, should I live stream it? I don't know. Or not the fights, but maybe just talk about it. But let me see here. We got Megan Anderson versus Norma Dumont. Of course, this is Dumont, her first fight in the UFC. You know, we got Megan Anderson who um, who bounced back with a solid win in her last fight against, um, uh, it was actually against Zara Dos Santos, you know. And i um, been watching Megan Anderson on online a lot. You know, she's uh, got the YouTube channel. You know, she's been doing her training camps and she's been working on a lot. You know, add more to her arsenal. Definitely got to work on that ground game, which she's been working on. Um, you know, really using that size and that reach to her advantage now. Um, somebody like Norma Dumont, I've seen a couple of her fights. You know, I think at 4-0, and she's still growing, but she's strong. You know, she's strong. She's not really like the fastest striker, but I think she's very physically strong. And, you know, she has a pretty decent ground game when she gets a fighter to the ground. You know, she knows how to use the weight. She knows how to muscle ladies when she gets there out of the out of the three fights that I saw but um my prediction on this one I probably have to probably have to go with Megan Anderson on this one man because like if Megan is able to keep this standing which I think she can in this one um and she starts jabbing early I think she could you know just score a knockout you know like her old Invicta days and I'm um if the knockout is there you know just take it you know I feel like Norma Dumont has a slower hand so Norma might be looking to get on the inside. So if she tries to jab her way in, you know, Megan's more of the faster, longer fighter, you know, just time her, you know, time her with your strikes, back her up with the jab and come over the top with the right hand. Cause, um, you know, she was kind of able to do that for a little bit against Felicia Spencer for like maybe like a few seconds, but Felicia just dove in because, you know, she's pretty strong and gritty like that. So I could see Norma Dumont trying that, but I think that Megan Anderson, her team, they kind of prepare for that. You know, a lot of people try to rush her now. You know, Holly Holm did. And like I said, Felicia Spencer did. They kind of rush in there to get her down and, you know, smother her reach. And um, I think she's kind of been working on that. So I think right away, if she sees the opening for a knockout, do it. You know, no need to showcase wrestling or ground game if you don't have to. You know, there's no need to showcase that. You know, I know you would rather get the finish because you get a finishing bonus, you know, so just go with that. So real quick, I guess real quick, I'll go with Megan Anderson by probably say like first round. No, second round stoppage. I think if she catches Norma Dumont you know, with a few good shots in the first round, Norma might make it out if she gets uh, Megan to the ground or she stays on the inside kind of clinches with her. She'll ride out the first round. And I think that Megan will be able to wear her down in like the second half or the second round and score a knockout. Yeah. So I go with Megan probably by like TKO or stoppage in the second round. Um, Co-main event, we got Felicia Spencer versus Zara Dos Santos. Dos Santos, you know, her last time out, she lost to Megan S in the first round. Was the first round? Let me double check here. But, you know, Felicia Spencer... Her last fight out against um, 
Cyborg, you know, I, to me, I thought that was kind of premature for her, you know, because I know that Felicia Spencer, she's a tough girl, you know, and I think that there was more to her level, you know, more to her game that she still needed to work on. And I think that Felicia Spencer could have, you know, given Cyborg a better fight. Granted, you know, she granted there would be a featherweight division. You know, it was kind of like with no featherweight division, everybody's kind of running around like the Wild West just saying, oh, you want to fight? you 145 pounds. We'll fight. You know, that's kind of what it's been like. You know, um, I don't know where Zara Dos Santos ranks. I really don't know where Megan ranks. Like she's probably number one or number two. Number one or number two is probably between Felicia Spencer and Megan Anderson because there is no damn flyweight division. You know, who else is it? I mean, featherweight division. Who else is there? Cyborg's gone. So most of the other ladies went down to bantamweight, you know, like Mason Chase on. So where where is your featherweight division? Why you got why you got these ladies, Dana, trying to fight a featherweight that a division that doesn't exist? But you know, I just just don't get it. But let's see, yeah. Zara, her last time out, first round, triangle choke for Megan Anderson. So, hmm, this one, man, I'm gonna have to go with Felicia Spencer, man. Like, Zara has hands, though. You know, Zara has some pretty powerful hands. You know, she did land some good shots on Megan Anderson in those opening minutes of the first, you know, first round. But somebody like Megan Anderson, like I said, she tried to, you know, push in. You know, she didn't want to trade she went straight to the ground and showcased some uh, ground skills so i think going into this with felicia spencer she'll be able to take the power of zara for a few you know after a few shots and you know she won't trade with her and she'll want to you know she'll want to do like she did like against pam bam and megan anderson you know just force her way in you know how she tried against cyborg you know i think that she can catch somebody like zara in this one you know try to push in and take it to the ground and go in for some ground and pound and, you know, just make it real physical and ugly. Cause that's how Felicia does. Like Felicia's like a scrapper. Like I can't really pinpoint just one style of hers, but she is like a mixed martial artist. You know, Felicia is like a real dog fighter, you know, like who said that? I can't remember who said it. was talking about like the, 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 how she looks. You don't see her being a fighter, but she is, you know, you know, she is like one of them girls you see in school or college, like real, you know, nice looking girl. Doesn't look like she's lifting weights or anything, ain't walking around, you know, you know, uh flexing all the time. But when it's time to fight, she throws down, you know. She's like the first one to have your back. You know, that's what Felicia looks like. But <laughs> yeah, man, but uh I think that uh, Zara, I think she can make this interesting, maybe like to the second or third round as far as you know, if she can keep it standing. If she strikes from the outside, you know, sets up her right hand, she could probably do what Cyborg did as far as, you know, keeping Felicia on honest. But she's going to have to really, really commit to that. You know, she's really going to have to commit to that. And I, I don't know, like if Felicia just comes on with the dog early, you know, Felicia takes it to the ground. She could get the submission by ground and pound or like a rear naked choke in like the first round. But Zara, you know, like I said, she can make this interesting, man. Um, taking it to the later rounds might favor her. You know, she's really, you know, working on her power and her strike, you know, the, her striking it all together. But, yeah, these are going to be two interesting fights, man. Um, definitely going to be two interesting fights I'll be looking forward to. And um, just telling Dana's ass, man, yeah, yo, man, like these ladies, you got four ladies right here. And you got so many other ladies that would probably like to stop cutting to 135 and be a 145er, you know. So make a, make a damn featherweight division, you know, like make a full-on featherweight division you know like can't keep having these ladies have to dip out to bantamweight kill themselves man but um let me see that was really all i wanted to talk about today on this show you know just kind of like like i said go back and talk about tyson fury and you know deontay wilder and how important it is to just prepare for the worst you know um it's good to like speak things to in existence and think positive but you know um it's always good to already go in with a mindset of humility sometimes, you know, kind of humbles you and makes you understand that you're human and it gets you to prepare for the, the possibilities of failure, you know. And I think that's what to me can make people stronger. You know, um, they say it's wiser to always try to imagine yourself as like, you know, the best in the world. But 
I think to be the best, you got to understand like certain things that could stop you from being the best, you know, like, like I said, you know, go back to Wilder, like if you, if you feel like Tyson Fury can outbox you or, you know, do certain things in the ring to you, then you automatically got to say, Hey, uh, I got to prepare for this. So it doesn't happen next time, you know? So all in all, man, it was a good fight of, you know, good weekend last week, you know, fights and we got some good ones coming up, but I, as far as Deontay Wilder, I, I don't want to see him take that rematch yet, man. Uh, maybe take a fight or two just to kind of, um, you know, hone his craft a little bit. Hone, hone his craft as a puncher. And what else, man? Uh, I'm probably going to talk about this on the next show, though. Um, some boxing and women's MMA stuff. Also, uh, Manny Pacquiao versus Terrence Crawford. You know, Bob Arum's trying to work on that fight. So I'm going to talk about that on the next episode. And of course, I will be talking about Valentina Shevchenko versus Joanne Calderwood. You know, I'm gonna be talking about that for the next four months. You know, at least once a show. <laughs> you know, maybe once every other show, man. Because I'm pulling for JoJo in this one, man. Like, I don't care. You know, I know that Valentina is like one of the pound for pound best, and she's looking unstoppable. But but everybody has a weakness. You know, it's just all that if JoJo can expose those weaknesses you know and capitalize off of them. but um yeah man that's really all i got on this one guys um i hope you like these shows i do these podcasts you know like i said i just want to go back and kind of talk about some technical things and you know whatever's on my mind in the sports of you know mixed martial arts and boxing but um just make sure y'all subscribe here on combo breaker 99 on the youtube channel you know follow me on instagram at combo breaker 99 and follow me on instagram at all boxing, everything. All boxing, everything. I just focus my email on boxing talk over there. And um, follow me and my man Boxing P's uh, Instagram, The Jab Effect. And subscribe to our podcast, The Jab Podcast, on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and SoundCloud. So, yeah, we, we, be, we be getting it in, man. So, podcast over there. Probably start doing some live streams over here as well. You know, I post a little channel update video Um try to post that today you know i just want to you know get get you know get some input from y'all as far as questions y'all want me to answer maybe some topics y'all want me to talk about for this show you know because as i get some more fans you know i kind of want to interact a little bit more and um yeah you know just kind of get out there a little bit more with y'all but uh yeah man for real though that's all i got on see y'all again man you know Damn, hold on, man. Valentina versus jojo i'm just looking at the picture again man I i'm excited for that fight man i want to see my girl win but <laughs> But yeah, man, that's all I got on this. And y'all, I'll be seeing y'all next week with another episode. And I'll be doing some post-fight vids, of course, after um, Megan Anderson fights and Felicia Spencer fights go down. But yeah, I'm Combo Breaker 99. I'm out, y'all. Peace.